This program is a presentation of UCTV for educational and non-commercial use only. Welcome to A Conversation with History. I'm Harry Chrysler of the Institute of International Studies. Our distinguished guest is Gary Wills. Gary Wills is a historian, a journalist, and a public intellectual. He has written more than 25 books on politics, religion, political philosophy, popular culture, and American history. He has won the Pulitzer Prize for General Nonfiction for Lincoln at Gettysburg, The Words That Remade America. He was awarded the National Medal for the Humanities in 1998, and he has twice won the National Book Critics Circle Award. His new book is Bomb Power, The Modern Presidency, and the National Security State. Professor Wills, welcome to Berkeley. Thank you. You actually wanted to go into the priesthood, I understand. I studied for five and a half years in a Jesuit seminary, and then I realized celibacy is not for me, so I got out of there. I wish some other priests had done that. Uh, but I still remain a, a Catholic. And so I went to uh, New York on the way to doing graduate work at Yale. I submitted an article on Time Magazine, and Bill Buckley called me up to National Review, and Bill Buckley mm -hmm. called me up and said, come see me. So I did. I was just about to enter graduate school at Yale, and he said, we just lost, he said, what are you doing? And I said, I'm doing a dissertation on Greek drama. He said, well, we just lost our drama critic. Why didn't you become our <laughs> drama critic? And I said, no, I've got to go to graduate school. But I started doing book reviews for Frank Meyer at the National Review. And Bill sent me down that summer. He said, well, will you stay around and do stuff for us in the summer? I said, OK. He sent me down to cover the Hoffa hearings in Washington. Conducted by the Kennedys. I mean, yeah, which yeah. is where I first saw the Kennedys in action. Uh, and but when, at the end of one day, they suspended the hearings. And I called up Bill and I said, what do I do now? And he said, come home, I'm having a party out in Sharon and uh, come out to Sharon. So I got on the plane and the plane got held up over LaGuardia. And the flight attendant who had come over to me and said, you're too young to be reading that book. Which you, what was the book you were reading? Bergson's Two Sources of Morality. Uh, sat down and I said, I'm going to miss a party in Connecticut because we've been held up here so long. And she said, where is it? And I said, Sharon. She said, that's right on my way home to Wallingford, so I'll give you a ride. And she did. And I, I expect her to come in when we got to the uh, Bill's house. And she said, no, I'm in uniform. I shouldn't be giving you a ride in the first place, so uh, no. So she left, and I, fresh out of the seminary, was so naive that I didn't get her phone number. Uh, and I was taken back into New York that night by another editor, and I was living in Bill's father's suite, 80 Park Avenue. And I got up in the morning, and I called Eastern Airlines. <laughs> and I said, uh, a stewardess, as they were called then, took me home last night. Uh, and, but I don't have her number. Her name's Natalie Cavallo. And they said, we don't give that <laughs> the numbers of our. So I, I thought a while, and I called back, and I said, I left a book, a marked up copy of a book that I have to review, uh, and I need my notes from it. So don't give me her number, but give her my number and tell her if she finds the book to call me. Mm -hmm. And of course, she went down and looked for the book, and there was none. And she called me and came right back into New York. We had our first date that day. And that she became your wife? Yeah, of the last 51 years. Aha. Uh -huh. Now, I, that leads to two questions. One is, what was the influence, the long-term influence, you think, that Buckley and his crowd had on you? Or, or was it too brief a period? 
No, they were very influential. Wilmer Kendall uh, was a very important uh, influence in terms of style and audacity. Uh, he was a he was a Yale professor who had been Bill's professor, and I got to know him when I was at Yale. Uh, Frank Meyer was a big influence. He was the book review editor for whom, whom I did most of the work. And I sailed with Bill a lot. Uh, but we had a falling out over Vietnam and over the Civil Rights Movement. He thought that Dr. King was hurting the American cause against communism by criticizing America. So after being quite close for about 13 years, we stopped talking for 30 years. But his sister Priscilla is a wonderful person called me up two years before he died and said, it's kind of silly that you were such friends for a long time and you never talked to each other anymore. So she got us back together. Uh, I'm so happy that she did because he, did, he didn't have long to live after that. Mm -hmm. And, and it, it's my understanding from what I've read that your wife helped turn you into a liberal or really was it more the events of the time? No, it was the events of the time. Okay. She was more liberal than I on certain things, but she was basically the kind of conservative Catholic that I was when we met. Uh, no, it was covering the 60s demonstrations, uh, the anti-war movement. What, what caused the final break with Bill, I no, wrote an article saying there's no conservative argument for the Vietnam War. It's hurting us, it's helping communists, uh, and he said, I can't publish that. He said, my, my constituents would not put up with that. So that ended it. Mm -hmm. and, and meanwhile, uh, you, you went on to pursue your dissertation. What was your dissertation on? Aeschylus, it? the Aristea. So you, you pursued your, uh, your academic work as a classist. Yeah. 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 As I say, the Jesuit high school I went to, I had four years of Latin and two years of Greek and loved the Greek especially. Uh, we read some of the scripture, but uh, a lot of the Odyssey, uh, a little bit of uh, Euripides Medea. So I continued that in the seminary and in graduate school and wrote about it. And as I say, I was telling Bill that I was going to work in Greek tragedy. But then along came the 60s and I got more interested in politics and at Johns Hopkins where I was teaching then. They asked me to do things about the classical background of Jefferson and Adams and other founders, and I started doing that. And that became more interesting, and uh, Northwestern then offered me a chair in uh, American Studies. And so I taught for 18 years at Hopkins uh, and 25 at Northwestern and retired five years ago. So after 43 years of teaching now, I'm just an emeritus professor. Mm -hmm. and, but during this period, you also, uh, in addition to being an academic, you, you, you did journalism assignments. You continued, yeah. to, and I'm curious, was it, was it hard mixing those two, or, or are they a nice complement for each other? Well, uh, I started doing just one column a week for the National Catholic Reporter when they f started out. Uh, but then, as I say, when the 60s came along, I was very swept up in that, and Harold Hayes, the editor of Esquire at the time, was really the trailblazer for a lot of modern journalism, and he asked me to, to write for him, and I had never thought that I would do that. What got me involved in politics is he called me up. Uh, during Christmas break when I had my family out visiting my parents in Michigan. And he said, uh, Murray Kempton was going to write a piece about Nixon in New Hampshire. Nixon was trying to have his comeback after everybody thought his career was over. And uh, he has some family troubles. Could you fly right away to New Hampshire and uh, write about? So it was brand new to me. It was the first time of two that he took me away from my family at Christmas. And so I wrote an article for Esquire. I followed Nixon around, both in New Hampshire and out in Wisconsin and elsewhere. And Dorothy de Santillana called me up. She was the wife of Giorgio de Santillana, the Renaissance historian in Boston, in Cambridge. And uh, 
she said after reading the article, you've got to write a book about Nixon. I said, I don't think he's going to win. And she said, it doesn't matter. What you talked about there was America. You used Nixon to look at America. So uh, you've got to write that. And I said, well, I can't because I bought, I've promised Harold Hayes to do a certain number of articles for him a year. And she said, if I can persuade him to accept chapters from the book as articles for him, uh, will you do it? And I said, sure. I didn't think she could, but she did. So the chapters that I did on uh, Spiro Agnew and on the Checker speech became Esquire articles mm -hmm. and cover stories that uh, caused some attention. And so then once Nixon Agonistes came out, by the way, I really had to fight for that title. Mm -hmm. The <laughs> people said, no, people will be afraid to try to pronounce it. So you can't use that as a title. I'm going to show my dog-eared <laughs> copy, which I have here. But please go ahead. It's an extraordinary book. I looked at looked it over in preparation for this interview, and it, it really holds up extraordinarily well. Well, the funny thing is, it's, it did all right in hardcover, but not great. Then. Watergate occurred, and the paperback that he just held up <laughs> took off. I went to Yale one time, and uh, it was in the last year of Nixon's presidency, and they said it's being taught in five different courses, uh, history, politics, and even writing. So uh, that's the thing that got me more and more paying attention to current events and had lots and lots of people, agents and editors and others, asking me to write about modern politics. I turned down most of them. Once you do, once you do a book about presidents, then every president who comes along, they ask you. I've been asked to do about uh, the first Bush and Ford and Carter and all of those. And I said, no, I, what I liked about the Nixon book is that it was a way of looking at America. And I said, that's been true of the book I did on Washington, the book I did on mm -hmm. Jefferson, the book I did on Reagan. And so my editor at the time, Alice Mayhew, said, uh, well, if you won't do a president, is there another president through whom you can look at America? And someone who's a, a polarizing figure like the, the presidents you've written about and a kind of person that lightning strikes. And I said, yeah, John Wayne. So that's how I wrote a book about John Wayne. Let's talk about this because it, it's fascinating. Uh, altogether, you've written more than 25 books. I, I counted, and uh, what what is there? What are the the three themes that that emerge that are, are of interest to you? One yeah. clearly is leadership, and placing a leader within his community, uh, and and his relation to his that community. Yeah. Uh, by the way, 25 books, some of those are translations and collections of essays, mm. so that it's, not, it's not as uh, formidable as it sounds. But uh, one of the things that I was always interested in was performance, both in theater and opera and other ways, and leadership as performance. You know, Washington had this great sense of presence and exactly how to uh, appeal to the best in America. Uh, his conscious assumption of the role of Cincinnatus. And by the way, he and Lincoln and some other politicians loved the theater. You know, Lincoln uh, invited actors into the White House and he read Shakespeare to his secretaries until they were bored <laughs> at night. Uh, Hay and Nicolay. Uh, he read to people, read Shakespeare to people on the presidential boat. Uh, when he had a painter in painting him, he read the scenes from King John, Shakespeare's King John, about the death of a young boy and broke into tears because his son had just died. So they all had this sense of performance whether they did it well or ill. Nixon had a sense of performance, but he could never quite pull it, it off. It was overdone, yeah. yeah. And, and you point out that Roosevelt really uh, turned his vulnerability, his, his polio affliction, into a sensitivity to be aware of how people were watching his performance. 
Yes, not only that, he also came up with extraordinarily clever ways to overcome uh, his problem. I had a friend who was in the Interior Department, and during the, uh, uh, it would have been, I guess, the beginning of the second term or the end of the first term of Roosevelt, Roosevelt had to go open a, a park in Virginia. And my friend was told to go and travel with him and brief him on the history of the park and how the money was raised for it and all that kind of thing. And so he had, like most people, was not really aware of how vulnerable Roosevelt was. But he said he, he arrived at the White House and the Secret Service brought the president out in a wheelchair and lifted him out and dumped him beside him in the back seat. And he said he just kind of collapsed. Mm -hmm. And he said, uh, we'll talk later, but I need to rest. So they, they drive off. And they stopped at a copse, a little collection of trees, where they had built a special outhouse for him so that he could uh, go to the bathroom without revealing his uh, affliction. And they drove on, and finally the Secret Service turned around and said, Mr. President, 20 minutes. And uh, he began to construct himself, pull himself up and, and listen to my friend talk. And they arrived, and the, the car drove up onto a ramp, and the top went down, and here's his big upper body, very strong from all the work that he did. And he, delivered, he was the picture of health, beaming and jovial and energetic. And the, end, the ceremony ended, and the top went up, and they drove back, and he slumped back down again. But he had to do that. He had to summon himself up for that kind of performance all of the later part of his life. So it's an incredible uh, story of, of will and style and determination. You, you also focus on the importance of words and how words can inspire people to change realities. Of course, you won the Pulitzer Prize for your Lincoln at Gettysburg book. Talk a little about that, because that, that seems kind of central to the way uh, you focus on leadership. Yeah, well, as I say, I was, I was trained as a classicist, and we did exercises in oratory and that kind of thing. We had to write Latin orations and Greek orations and study the rules of classical rhetoric. So preaching and oratory has always fascinated me, especially black preachers. They're the, they're the best speakers in America. And uh, the best speeches that I've heard are by Jim Bevel and Jesse uh, Jackson and Dr. King, of course. Uh, so that's something that, that has always intrigued me. And, it's, and the performance of political oratory. Reagan's, for instance, he was a, he was a master at it, of course. And, and, uh, and Franklin Roosevelt. People forget that, you know, some people say a president really should write his own words. Well, Washington didn't. Roosevelt didn't. Uh, it's true Woodrow Wilson did, but he was not really on the par with Washington and, and uh, others. Jefferson did. Madison did. But it's very rare that anybody does the, their own words now. You know, they tinker and they give ideas and all of that. But uh, Barack Obama is the only one for a long time who's capable of doing his own words, as you know from his book. The funny thing about Jimmy Carter is that he was a very good writer. That, that book he wrote about why not the best, he was a very clear writer, very organized. But he was a bad speaker. Uh, Johnson was a bad speaker. Uh, well, let me tell you a little story about Carter, which shows the two sides of him. I was on a Wyoming symposium with him, a meeting, uh, and in the afternoon he had a small gathering of students and spoke really off the cuff and went over terrifically. At one point a young woman got up and said, now you had to enforce the laws when you were the President of the United States. What do you think about your daughter Amy being arrested for breaking the law? She was arrested for demonstrating against apartheid in front of the South African Embassy. And he said, I cannot tell you how proud I am mm. of her. 
if you young people don't act on your conscience now, when will you? Later on, you'll have other conflicting uh, duties, you'll have family, you'll have jobs, you'll have all those things. So for her to speak up her mind just made me so proud. And they loved him. That night, he got up before a huge gymnasium full of everybody in Wyoming, because there's not much going on in Wyoming, and started reading this long speech about agape love. And everybody just streamed out. <laughs> <You know? laughs> so it was so astonishing to see the one side of him and the other side of him in the, in the space of a couple of hours. But before we talk about your new book, because I think it relates to this whole question of the Obama presidency in its first year, what I know originally during the campaign you supported Obama. Uh, what attracted to you to him? And what was it, uh, was it, what, was it, is it his oratory and the possibilities there for changing the country? Uh, sure, I read his book and admired it a lot. Bob Silvers, my editor at New York Review said, we'll finally have somebody in the White House who can write as well as Jefferson. <laughs> and I, I said, well, maybe not. Uh, or Lincoln. Uh, but then I said to my friend Bill Press, uh, that's an extraordinary book. And he said, yeah, did you, read, did you listen to him read it on the audio book? And I said, no. He said, listen. And it's a totally different experience. Mm. The intimacy with his mother, the ties to Africa. For one thing, he imitates the speech of people that he's quoting. Street talk of black kids, the African accent of his father, the African accent of his half-sister. On the tape. Yeah. Uh, on the tape. Uh, uh, different Af African accents. He's obviously got a very good ear. Uh, so sure, those were among the other things. Also, just the immense pride that Americans could take that they would elect a black person to be president. So that's, those were the reasons that I was... Uh, also, I knew some of the people who were, I never, I didn't know him, but I knew some of the people who were supporting him and running his campaign, uh, like Rahm Emanuel. I know him very well from, from Chicago. So those were the reasons. But then I was one of nine historians invited to the White House to give him advice at dinner. It was off the record, so I can't really go into that. But. Uh, about anything in particular, or can you, yeah? About other presidents, about. I see. And, and about the problems he's, he was facing. Uh, but, you know, this, is kind of, this may be psychobabble, but I think one of the things that may be hindering him is that he's so aware that he is the change, that it's such a break with our history to elect a black president. And that's such an odd thing to some people, which is why they're calling him not an American or socialist or fascist or whatever, that he wants to emphasize continuity almost to a fault. So even though he came to national attention by opposing the Iraq war, he appointed his secretary of state, someone who voted for the Iraq war, his vice president, someone who voted for the Iraq war, uh, his secretary of defense, someone who conducted the Iraq war, the two generals in Afghanistan who had conducted the Iraq war. That's continuity, all right, but is it the continuity that uh, we need? And then I noticed that the same thing was occurring in other things. He wanted to face up to the banking problems. So he put, put in Geithner and Summers and Bernanke, the people who had got us into the banking problems. Uh, he wanted to bring us health care. And the first people he invited into the White House were the AMA, the big pharma, the insurance companies. And he actually said, uh, foolishly, this is the first time we've had all these people on our side. Well, he, they weren't on his side. They were snookering him. So I think that he's... His rhetoric of a post-racial, post-partisan, post-blue state, red state America is just unrealistic, and the Republican Party has played him for a fool. Uh, let's compare him to Lincoln. In your Lincoln book, uh, what you're showing us, just in a beautifully written volume, is that Lincoln at Gettysburg found the words 
to take us back to the Declaration of Independence so that we could be reconciled to the consequences of the war, to the dead on the battlefield, and so on. So he was pointing to the future with words. Now, that was a possibility that Obama offered. In his yeah, but just doing speeches is not enough. Lincoln could do that beautifully. But Lincoln was so shrewd, so good at sizing people up. Doris Kearns Goodwin's book on his, the way he first hired and then used his cabinet uh, is, is terrific on that. He was a, a terribly gifted lawyer. He was famous for his courtroom reading of, of everybody, of the defendant and the plaintiff and the jury and the judge. Uh, his partner said he scared the pants off of his clients because they said, he's giving away our whole case. But Lincoln knew that if he could bring the nub of the matter to the jury, the case was what was won. Uh, so he was a tactician in that way. and he. He became, see, the, the, he was inexperienced in only one way. He was very experienced in people and politics, but uh, he was not experienced in war. And James McPherson's mm -hmm. rec most recent book on him as a uh, military leader shows how much he went to work studying, uh, how much he used his knowledge of people to play generals off against each other, uh, how much he fled, gave them reins to uh, do themselves in, uh, and how much when he found somebody like Grant, he just stuck to him like uh, a burr. You know, he he knew he found, he had found his man, uh, and partly that was because of words. You no, know, Grant, we found out when he wrote his memoirs, was a very good writer, and he was a very had a very analytical mind, and his battlefield dispatches are models of clarity. You know, written in the midst of all of the pressures of uh, a campaign. And Lincoln lived over in the telegraph office just waiting for words from Grant because he knew that there were the things he could uh, de depend on. So how would you compare Obama? Are you, are, you not, are you suggesting that he may not have enough experience in too many realms or? Well, Chicago can be a pretty rough school and he, he rose by uh, some pretty rough tactics. But uh, I think uh, he may be intimidated by his own. S s one of the things that he did from the very beginning at, at the law school when he became the editor of the Law Review, he was omnidirectionally placatory, people who worked with him said. He brought in all views. Uh, he allowed conservative judges to write for the review. He did all of that, which was compensatory for his being, you know, a young black man, the first black editor of the Law Review. And I think that that experience may have given him the wrong lesson, uh, and that he wants now, he, over and over and over and over, he's, he's trying to placate people who are obviously not going to be placated. Uh, for instance, on the health thing, he said, well, I'll, I really want this health thing and I have a certain preference for the public option, but I, I will leave it up to Congress. Now, Congress fiddled around and fiddled around and allowed the whole debacle of the summer of town hall meetings to occur. And the result is the insurance companies have a lot of wiggle room now, which means that the prices are going to go up. That's the main thing to say against the health care plan now, is that it's going to cost more, not less. If he had said at the very outset, the only thing that will cut prices is a public option that will compete with the insurance companies and force them to cut their uh, uh, prices, if he had said that, I think the whole thing would have been over. He, if he had said it in February when he was riding high in the polls. And now, to this day, he's saying, oh, well, let's all get together. And uh, as uh, <laughs> Rachel Maddow said last night, he thinks everything is kumbaya. <laughs> <laughs>
Let's let's talk now about your book. Let me show it again. Bomb power, the modern presidency, and the national security state. Why bomb power? Well, in every other war, we've had emergency powers granted in an emergency. Most many of them illegal, unconstitutional. Suspension of habeas corpus in the Civil War, detention of Japanese Americans in World War II. But after those wars, there's a return to a constitutional order. The Supreme Court says ha suspending habeas corpus is unconstitutional, as is interning the uh, Japanese Americans. But the Manhattan Project was a massive violation of laws on every level. And we never went back to normal after that. In fact, we took it as a model because it worked. Uh, the Manhattan Project, though, it employed thousands of people in 80 locales and was kept entirely from Congress. It spent billions of dollars in modern value without Congress authorizing a penny. Uh, it was outside the chain of military command. General Leslie Groves was off on his own with only that panel that Franklin Roosevelt had appointed. Uh, he resorted to all kinds of threats and spying. He even sent an assassin to kill Werner Heisenberg in uh, Europe because he thought he had too much knowledge about atom uh, bomb production. And that would tip the balance in the race yeah, against right. the Germans. Yeah. He had his own little private air force. Uh, he took planes right off the production line, reconfigured them to drop the bombs, trained pilots to fly them. Uh, without telling the pilots what their ultimate purpose would be. He actually ran flights into Japan dropping dummy bombs to g do this. So he had Almogordo as a test site, Tinian Island as a takeoff site. He kept all of this so secret that Senator Truman, when he was investigating the expenditure of government money during the war, never caught on. And in fact, as vice president, he didn't know anything about the bomb. You know, that's an astounding thing that all this could go on uh, against all kinds of constitutional and statutory and other uh, restrictions and get away with it. But there was no going back because the country liked what he did. Truman said it's the, the greatest thing in history, the creation of the bomb. And so the creation of a secrecy around the bomb, around its production, around its perfection as they thought of it, uh, around its deployment around the world in various locales, that just grew and grew. And, and agencies were created to do this, the NSA, the NSC, the CIA. And for the first time in history, President Truman was given the absolute right with no say from anybody else to initiate war. They said in the case of a nuclear attack, there's no time to think about it, uh, to consult Congress, to instruct the public. One man will have to either anticipate or retaliate in case we're attacked with a nuclear weapon. Well, that's in a way understandable. You know, given the premise, if, if you think another person's going to get the bomb and use it on us, but when Truman had his first opportunity to go to non-nuclear war in Korea, Dean Acheson, his Secretary of State, said, this is not what you were given this absolute arbitrary control over, but to protect your absolute arbitrary control, don't ask Congress for a single mm -hmm. input into going to war with Korea. Well, it, that was the first presidential war in the sense of uh, not not even asking Congress, not even letting Congress know things. Ever since, there has been no congressional declaration of war. All that time. Before, you know, 1812, Mexican War, Civil War, World War I, World War II, they were all congressionally uh, declared as the Constitution provides. So once we started down this path, the the presidential initiative just grew and grew. It, it shows in things like his very title of Commander-in-Chief. Mm -hmm. Commander-in-Chief was really a rather modest title in its origins. The British used it if you had several admirals out in a sector of the ocean whose authorities might conflict. It was said by the uh, government, by parliament, that one will be Commander-in-Chief, at least in that theater for that campaign. 
It was a temporary title. It didn't make the admiral any more or less an admiral, and he remained an admiral after the uh, campaign ended. And so when Washington was sent to Boston, there were generals of the militia, there were conflicting authorities there, and they said, well, you be the commander in chief. And that was a problem that would continue conflicting authorities, especially with militias in the War of 1812. But in the Constitution, it was said, the president will be the commander in chief of the military. And they thought the military at war, because they were not thinking of a standing army in peacetime and of the militias when called into national service. So he's not even the commander in chief of the National Guard unless it's federalized. But that's, that was not a military office. That was proved in a case in New York. Part of George Washington's estate was in Dutchess County, New York, and his relatives there said, well, there is a tax exemption for military veterans there, and George Washington is clearly that, so we should get that tax exemption. Well, that went to court, and they said, sure enough, he was a general under the uh, Continental Congress before the uh, United States existed, before there was a constitution. But when there was a constitution, he was made the commander in chief without being made a military officer. That's proved by the fact that he gets no military pay, he gets no military pension, he cannot be court-martialed as every military officer can, he can only be impeached, which is a civilian procedure. He's not a military officer, he's a civilian. And that's the genius of the Constitution, that we have civilian control of the military. Well, now, we're told in many, many ways that uh, the President is our Commander-in-Chief. We civilians are now asked to recognize him as our commander-in-chief. We're told when we vote, you're voting for your commander-in-chief. I wrote an op-ed article in the New York Times quoting the Constitution and saying, well, according to the Constitution, he's not my commander-in-chief, I'm a civilian. And I got the most extraordinarily angry letters saying, if he's not your commander-in-chief, you're not an American, get out of this country. Mm -hmm. So we have defined citizenship now, and we've defined the presidency as synonymous with commander-in-chief. And the militarization is shown in the fact that now, when the president gets off his helicopter or Air Force One, he's saluted as if he were a military officer. And that's against military procedure. You salute the uniform. Uh, a general out of uniform is not saluted. But now we salute the president. Is, I, I, I want to understand, because there, there, a criticism can be made of the book that you put too much into this origins of the nuclear equation. Uh, and, in fact, the, most of the book really deals with all the other ways that this spun out, uh, the secret wars that we waged and, and, and so on and so forth. So what, what I, I want to understand what you're saying uh, in the beginning of the book, because you're really saying that it created a base of power. This is my paraphrasing now. That, in other words, changed the ideas of incumbent presidents about what they could do constitutionally. Well, is it, that, cre is it, that created, it created instruments, the instruments yeah. of the national security state. Because of the bomb was this great secret we had to keep, we started classifying secrets in extraordinary ways. We set up the NSA, the NSC, the CIA, all of these which were meant to protect our nuclear development. We set up bases around the world to be safe harbors for our strategic air command originally, keeping bombs in the air all around the world, and then our submarines. And, but the idea that the president has the initiative in war grew out of that first grant, mm -hmm. the, the initiative for nuclear war. And to show you how that continues, during the Reagan administration, there had been because of the nuclear threat, the idea of decapitation, if the top tier of our government is wiped out, we've got to have presidential succession. So an amendment was set up to go down through the Speaker of the House and the other cabinet members and others down the way. But during the Reagan administration, they decided secretly that if the presidency devolved on let's say the Speaker of the House, he or she won't know the procedures for launching nuclear war. They're very technical, they're very difficult. There are a lot of bars to, pre to prevent mistakes, hasty action. 
And so they set up a secret meeting. Cheney and Rumsfeld were the White House staffers who were involved in this. They were called and said, go off in the middle of the night to an undisclosed location at the beginning of that term. Don't tell your wives, don't tell anybody. And they wargamed response to nuclear war. They chose uh, whatever cabinet member was still alive, and they were drilled in the procedures by technicians and others who drilled the president. Uh, nobody knew about that. It was outside the line of succession. It was outside the chain of military command. It was acting just like the Manhattan Project. And to show you how alive that is, it was actually resorted to when the Twin Towers were attacked. Mm -hmm. Cheney was in the White House, having done these, this, these drills for years. The president was flying around, and he, Cheney was told that there were planes, several planes, still up there come, uh, who were targeting uh, places in America. He scrambled jets to shoot down the planes. He didn't ask the president, uh, just as he wouldn't have asked them in, that, in those midnight drills. Scooter Libby, standing next to him, said he thought, we've got to get the planes before they get to the targets. And he hesitated no more than a batter hesitates when a pitch is coming at him. And he said that as a matter of praise. That, mm -hmm. And then he called the president, but not before he did it. The 9-11 Commission showed that he didn't even consult the president. Mm -hmm. So that was bomb power at work. Mm -hmm. And in fact, you quote Cheney, who, who said, was right to say that the real logic of all these things is the president's solitary control of the bomb. This is Cheney sure. as, as vice sure. president. Now, now the, question, the question then becomes, if we go back to our discussion of leadership, what can reverse what has become the national security state? Clearly, we are in a situation where the constitutional norms have been overthrown or reinterpreted. You pointed that out with Commander-in-Chief. You point out in the book with regard to uh, the War Powers Act, because Congress, in a way, in that act, gives the president a power he doesn't have and says, let us come along when, yeah, you, when right. you make war. And then that wasn't even observed. Yeah, right. It's very difficult. You know, the Church Committee tried to rein in the CIA, and it failed. Uh, these are a kind of Frankenstein monster. Remember when the Church Committee tried to rein in the uh, CIA because they found out they were assassinating foreign leaders, when William Colesby, who was the director, a, a, a brought in the information that Congress asked for. He was denounced as a traitor uh, by the CIA. When Richard Helms lied to Congress, he was, he was called a hero. So. These are like Frankenstein's monster out there. Once they get going, they have turf to protect. They have built up what they call assets. So when an Obama comes in, they, I'm sure they go to him and they say, well, you've spoken out against rendition and military tribunals and uh, non-representation of uh, captive foreigners. Uh, but wait a minute, it took us years to build up this structure, and you may need it down the road. And our people need to be supported to keep them loyal, to keep their morale up. And all, besides that, we have all these assets around the world. And if we don't try to use them and control them, they know too much. You know, now we have more contractors in Afghanistan and Iraq than we have military people. And this, this started way back with the coup in Iran when Eisenhower said, well, let's knock off uh, Mossadegh because he's pestering our allies, cutting off their oil supplies, and let's bring back the Shah. Well, Kermit Roosevelt of the CIA hired thugs and street people to demonstrate against uh, Mossadegh. And he was so successful, as they thought, that Eisenhower went on to authorize another four coups. Uh, which the American people knew nothing about. Uh, but look at the consequences. All of our troubles in Iran come from the fact that we put back an unpopular man and, they, and we're resented for having put the Shah back in. Uh, and that happened with many of the puppets we put in or the people we knocked off. Stephen Kinsner has uh, a wonderful book in which he says, 
we are responsible for over a hundred coups or attempted coups in the post-World War II era. <laughs> you know, and every time we do that, we create this tale of people who are assets, who are actually embarrassments. You know, the, the break-in at the Watergate was done by some of the people, by Cubans who were involved in the Bay of Pigs. <laughs> These people are around, and you use them. But they're, they're loose cannons. It, you, you pointed earlier how the, 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 uh, the routines, the procedures for dealing in the Cold War with nuclear weapons slid into the post-9-11 world at the, the time of the 9-11 attack. Would, would a different set of leaders made a difference? I mean, when, when, you, when you go through this list of the various bricks that were added to create the foundation for the, it, it's pretty overwhelming. So yeah. what could make a difference? Or are you suggesting that nothing could make a, a difference? I mean, obviously, we have the case of Mr. Obama. You know, clearly, he's escalating in Afghanistan and seems, although he refers to the lessons of Vietnam, seems not to, to be uh, acting on them. Yeah, well, the, the record is not very encouraging. Let me say, uh, President Clinton did some good things. He cut back on signing statements. He started a declassification program, which was the most extensive that had occurred up to that time, but it was resisted by the government. And the minute George Bush came in, he went right back to classifying on a huge uh, scale, cut back on the Freedom of Information Act, extended the, the uh, sequestration of presidential papers. So even a, a minimal gain can be quickly reversed, and the American people don't even know it, don't even notice it. Uh, and this is all about secrecy often, yeah, yeah. Yeah, So it's very hard to uh, penetrate this wall of secrecy. The, uh, and presidents are invested in it. For instance, when Daniel Ellsberg leaked the Pentagon Papers, President Johnson had been saying, if you only knew what I know, you'd realize I'm acting very prudently and wisely in Vietnam. And Ellsberg, who had helped create the Pentagon Papers, knew that he was uh, wrong, that there was no great secret knowledge, that the Pentagon Papers were full of contradictory and ignorant and uh, lying uh, materials. And so when he leaked them, Nixon uh, tried to prevent the publication of them, and he told the Justice Department to prosecute Ellsberg. Some around Nixon said, why are you doing this? All of the stuff in the Pentagon Papers is about the Lyndon Johnson administration. None of it is about you. It all dates back 20 years, uh, most of it. And, but he said, no, we can't allow our power of secrecy to be invaded. So you keep a secret even when it's not worth keeping. Uh, that's the whole point of secrecy now, that it's not to deceive an enemy. It's to deceive Americans or Congress or uh, the press. And the best, one of my favorite examples of that is uh, my favorite Doonesbury strip, which Gary Trudeau gave me the original of and hangs on my wall, somebody going to Cambodia and seeing this flattened country and, and a couple standing before their ruined home, and, and he says, wow, this is historic ground. This is the site of the secret bombing of Cambodia. And the man in front of his disappeared house says, oh, no, it was no secret. I said to Martha, there are the bombs. <laughs> and it was not secret from the Cambodians, it was to keep Congress from knowing that he had invaded another country with which we were not at war and he was using funds meant for Vietnam now in, in Cambodia. So that's what secrecy has become more than anything, a covering up of blunders, of deceptions, of uh, all kinds of, of uh, wrongdoing. The Reynolds case is a wonderful case, example of that, that the basic Supreme Court case on which state secret uh, doctrine is used in trial after trial comes from a crash of an Air Force plane where civilians were on board doing some electronic work and w when the plane went down some civilians died and some lived. The ones who lived said about the ones who died uh, there was something really wrong about that plane were bad procedures and panicky reaction and 
Uh, they didn't tell us even where the hatches were to bail out or how to go about evacuating the plane. And so the survivors of those who died, the civilians who died, sued the Air Force. The Air Force said, well, we have an investigation of that crash, but it's classified, so you can't have it. And they went to court and they said to the judge, uh, you can't have it. And the judge said, well, show it to me in camera. And if there are certain secrets to be kept, I'll keep them. And if the whole thing has to be suppressed, I'll suppress them. They said, oh, no, we can't. You're not, you don't have clearance. <laughs> uh, it's classified. They went to another court. The same thing occurred. Then they went to the Supreme Court, and this was during the Korean War, and, and Vinson was the chief justice. And he said, we can't in wartime undermine the uh, morale of the Air Force, so I won't even ask to see the investigation in camera. Well, 15 years or so later, the investigation was routinely declassified with a mass of other documents, and the relatives of those who died found that there were no state secrets at all in there. There was massive proof of criminal neglect. The plane had had a fire beforehand. It was badly uh, maintained. The pilot turned off the wrong engine. Uh, all of the emergency procedures were neglected. So again, they tried to sue for criminal neglect under a different uh, plea. And this was the Rehnquist court. And he asked Theodore Olson and other people whether he should entertain, even entertain this case. And they said, oh no, even if there are no state secrets, there are indications of how state secrets might be kept mosaic. somewhere else. Yes, and there's, there's a mosaic theory. If you have a, only one pebble from a mosaic, you can create the whole mo mosaic out of that. And so the Rehnquist court accepted that. And this case, based on an absolute lie to protect the government, mm -hmm. is still the reigning precedent that's cited whenever the, the uh, government wants to say, you can't proceed in this case because it's got such state secrets. In, uh, you are a historian of, of the ideas that, that influence the men, who, the founding fathers who wrote our Constitution. And in this book, you're showing us again and again how power essentially overturns ideas uh, that were present at the creation. A unitary executive was really about uh, making the president accountable, and it's become a way of making him unaccountable exactly. to the other branches of government. Signing statements have become vehicles for creating by the president a record that defies the actual legislative record. So across the board, step by step, uh, the, uh, the constitutional ideas are, are being overturned. So does history have a role anymore in, in correcting, or will it only be countervailing power that puts an end to this? Good, good question. Uh, and I don't have a quick answer to that, because it's so, uh, it's a matter of technology, of inertia, of bureaucracy, of secrecy as a uh, a bureaucratic imperative. That exists all the time. It, you know, it exists uh, in other countries. But no other country after the war built a national security state, no other democratic country built a national security state like ours, even those who adopted the bomb, developed the bomb, like de Gaulle developed his force de frappe so that America could not boss him around. Uh, but this kind of uh, massive defiance of Congress in the name of executive privilege uh, has not occurred elsewhere. And, you know, you bring up signing statements. George Bush, the second, George W. Bush, did more signing statements than all 42 preceding presidents put together. And he just automatically said, that's unconstitutional, so I'm not going to observe it. Well, first of all, it's not the president's job to say what's unconstitutional, it's the Supreme Court's job. And what is a signing statement? He's saying, you think that's a law, but I don't, so I won't uh, obey it. That's either nullification, you know, which was <laughs> declared uh, unconstitutional, or it's uh, a line item veto, which is not statutory, or it's a pocket veto. It's all of those things put together, and uh, we just allow it to happen. You know, it started in a really serious way under Reagan with the Justice Department of Ed Meese. Uh, 
and it has just galloped. And the interesting thing is, Obama's doing signing statements. Uh, then he was criticized for that, and he said, well, I might not make a signing statement on what I will observe or not, but if I have beforehand suggested that something is unconstitutional, then I won't observe it. That's even worse. That's a stealth signing statement, <laughs> you know? Uh, so it's very hard to reverse these. And uh, the War Powers Act, the Church Committee, the Clinton declassification, all of those things, there are little surges of energy and then they're engulfed by this long-range tide that we have observed since World War II. So how would you advise students to be prepared to be responsible citizens in the world you're describing? Well, find the, uh, the few members of Congress who are willing to stand up to this and uh, throw enough support to them that they can become heroes. And others will be ashamed not to follow them. Uh, you know, we haven't had too many of those. Only two people voted against the uh, Tonkin Gulf Resolution, and uh, they were vilified. The people who stand up against the, the Iraq War were called unpatriotic and even traitors. Uh, so you've got to find the few that you can count on uh, and, and try to make them models and throw a lot of support to them. The ultimate solution may be that the only way to get rid of bomb power is to get rid of the bomb. Now that sounds utopian, but Paul Nitze, who rent, spent his whole career championing the bomb, ended up at the end saying, it doesn't really uh, enhance our security at all. We should get rid of it. Well, on that note, uh, Professor Wills, I want to thank you very much for being here. Let me show our, the audience our book because it's, it's quite a, an impressive uh, uh, an account of how we have come to the present situation of the American presidency and the national security state. Thank you very much for being with us today. It was a joy. And thank you very much for joining us for this conversation with history. <laughs> <laughs>